start with the last talk of the conference. And it's a pleasure to introduce John Teichner to give this last talk, which is just part of this. Thank you for the introduction, Gabby. And since I'm the last speaker, it's my uh, good pleasure to um, encourage us all to thank the uh, organizers of this fantastic. <laughs> So what did he show? He showed us the continuity of these tremors as you vary. He showed us that the distance goes to zero 100% of the time. So what we get is we get you start at a point that's minimal and not uniquely ergodic in the eigenform locus, and you tremor away from the eigenform locus for some bounded amount of time. And then you start Bohr's cycle flowing. You'll spend 100% of your time equidistributing to the eigenform locus, and maybe you'll take some sojourns. But in terms of the measure you put down, your empirical measure, you're not going to see that. And so we've taken care of part A. Everyone happy with that? We're happy. Good. OK, so what am I going to focus my talk on? I'm going to talk, focus my talk on B, and I'm going to talk, focus my talk on D. So B and D, in that order. Okay, so first off, I want to blather a little bit more about what exactly is E for. So what is E4? Well, here's a picture of it. It's got some coordinates. I can wiggle the sides of these pieces, but they come in pairs. Not just the pairs you see that are parallel, but this side is paired with this side, and I want to keep them the same and in the same direction, and similarly this side with this side. Okay? And similarly, I've got the slit, and so I can move these three parameters around, and that's the space E4. Let's just make a remark that if our slit is horizontal, is horizontal. So what's the slit? The slit is this white line here, is horizontal, with length exactly equal to h. Then I basically get a copy of SL2R mod SL2Z. In E. Okay. So if I fix in the length and the direction of the slit, what freedom do I have? I have the freedom of what my torus is. So I basically have SL2R mod SL2Z. Anyone be about that? So now I want to move on to try and prove uh, B for you. So let's state a theorem. So a theorem. So this is all joint work with John and Barak. So <laughs> the length of H should be commensurable with the length of they're exactly the same. Where in E4, they're exactly the same. The, no, the slit. The slit, I'm fixing to have length h. h could be the square root of 2. So h has nothing to do with the shape of the torus. So. Correct. Correct. It's just the slit. Maybe you don't get a copy of that, so, uh, that symmetric field space. Uh, I have the word basically. basically. I have the word basically because issues about if your period of your cylinder is shorter. So that's the way the word basically. Yeah. Are you content? Oh. So, um, okay, so what's the theorem? The theorem is that there exists a dense <laughs> delta uh, subset 
of H11. That is, uh, which is not, so that every point in it is not UT generic for any measure. i.e., so what do I mean by not generic for any measure? i.e., there exists f in continuous <coughs> compactly supported fu functions of my stratum so that the limit as t goes to infinity of 1 over t integral 0 to t of f of u t q dt does not exist. So the limit doesn't go to anything. Uh, so just to remark, what does gens g delta mean? It senses it, it's this type, type of sets that are large in the sense of the bare category theorem. And so in particular, the intersection to, of two, a finite number, of, or in fact a countable number of these, is going to still be a dense g delta. Uniquely ergodics or recurrent things are all dense g delta sets. So in fact, there exists uh, surfaces whose horizontal foliation is uniquely ergodic, but who under the Horace cycle flow do not equidistribute to any mesh. Um, our main tool, as might be suggested by the words dense G delta, is the bare category theorem. Okay, so we're going to do a bare category argument, and a lot of our strategy will be based on kind of rather straightforward continuity arguments. And our proof relies on some basic properties of the spiky fish. So I'm going to make a definition. Uh, so definition, the L spiky fish <laughs> is SL, SL equal to the union of S and zero comma L of the union <coughs> union of omega in E4 in E uh, so that the horizontal foliation is aperiodic horizontal flow is aperiodic <coughs> of trim S of omega Okay, so I'll just take a brief word. Uh, for the purposes of my talk, I'm going to drop the parameter nu in my tremors. Why am I able to do this? This locus that we're talking about has it, at most two ergodic measures. You can see them in, under the assumption of aperiodicity, which I'm making. You can see that because any ergodic invariant measure has to project to a measure on the torus, which is invariant. And assuming that it's aperiodic, there's only one such of those up to scale. I normalize so that it's size 1, and then in principle I have two choices, but these two measures are exchanged under by an element of the mapping class group. So I can just, since I'm modding out by that, I'm in the moduli space of translation surfaces, I only get one of them, uh, and so this makes sense. Is everyone happy about that? Um, so we're going to take this set, and we're going to take its closure. So this is what the spiky fish is, and a uh, good part of my talk is going to be based on showing that that is, dense, uh, th that that is the funky thing in part D. Is everyone okay with that? D. 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 Yeah. Okay. Sorry, John, are you, do, are you talking about B or D right now? They're interconnected. So interconnected. I'm talking about B now. But okay. D is going to be describing that this is an orbit closure. Thank you for that question. So now we have a proposition. The union over L of S sub L is dense in H1. Okay. So let's return to this picture. 
And let's return to this copy of SL2, this basic copy of SL2R mod SL2Z sitting inside uh, E, where I fix the horizontal lengths to be a particular thing. And let's imagine I'm performing a cylinder deformation, as was mentioned by a couple of people in this talk. In this case, in Barak's talk, um, including Barak, when I'm doing the tremor map, I'm just really moving one of the cylinders and leaving the other one fixed. Okay. One of the tori and leaving the other tori fixed. So you can imagine that as you do this longer and longer, if you fix your base torus, you then get all up to epsilon. You get all possible copies of your other torus there. And of course, you can do horse cycle on the whole. You're, you can do this at all of E4, and you can end up pairing any two choices of tori. Um, you, you can pair any two choices of tori so long as their areas are the same. Okay? So that's. That's the picture you get. And as you make the lengths get longer and longer and longer, you get a dense subset of uh, H11 in this way. Okay? So this is idea of proof. Proof. Uh, two tori with area one half. glued along horizontal slits. <coughs> is a dense set in each one. Mm -hmm. is everyone happy about this basic idea? So anywhere you're sitting in H11, you can move yourself just a little bit to a picture where you have two, two tori glued along an absolutely enormous horizontal slit. And these are the list of the, and this is contained in the set you can get from the union of all of the SLs. In particular, you can get this for the SL with L being your, the size of your horizontal slit. This is part three of the. Yes, okay, yeah, so. I'll um, check mark here. Thank you. All right. So, um, now let's state a lemma. So this is kind of a straightforward lemma in ergodics theory, but please feel free to add, I'll try and mumble some words of the proof. So, um, but please, if it doesn't make sense, let me know. So the setting is I've got a continuous flow on a sigma compact metric space. Flow. <laughs> a sigma compact metric space. For example, H11. And the set of x, so that x is ht generic for mu, is dense. So mu is some ht invariant measure on x comma d, my sigma compact metric space. Remember what it means to be generic. <laughs> what I do is I take x, I flow forward for time capital T, I average along that piece. This gives me a way to assign um, numbers to continuous functions. That's a measure. I take the weak star limit of this as t goes to infinity. That's a, I am assuming that it converges, and moreover that it converges to mu. And I want the set of such points to be dense. Is everyone happy about this? Okay. So then, The set of y, so that there exists <coughs> t1 comma da 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 going to infinity with the limit uh, i goes to infinity of 1 over t sub i of the intersection from 0 to t sub i of f of h sub t, which is the t of y, dt, being equal to the integral of f d mu is a 
Gen Street Alpha. Ah, oh, I'm sorry, for all F and for all continuously compactly supported F. Is a dense G delta. Okay, so what was my assumption? My assumption was about the empirical measures along the orbit converging to mu. I'm asking that the empirical measures along y converge to mu along a subsequence. Okay, and I go from density to it being a dense G delta. Is everyone okay with this? Yes? What are the assumptions of measure? It's a nice measure. Borel, let's say. Borel. So this is really just a very standard fact in ergodic theory, and basically it follows from the fact that continuous compactly supported functions have a have a countable supernorm dense set. So there's nothing fancy going on. Sorry, just two questions. Yeah. Oh, do you mean the, their existence? No, no, no. The assumption is that the set of the point structure is undeniable. Oh, thank you very okay. much, Karina. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the set is there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now we're basically done. Okay. So now, proof of B. Of B. Okay. Uh, by the proposition. Uh, we have the assumption of the dilemma. Dilemma. Uh, for um, mu uh, sub e, what Barak was calling the flat measure on the eigen for locus or just the measure given locally in coordinates by letting me twiddle the sides in the slit. Okay. We have the assumptions of formula sub e. So, the set of points uh, which with empirical measure Converge to mu e. Well, on a subsequence, is a density delta. Now, similarly. The set that with empirical measures <coughs> converge along a subsequence <coughs> to the Maser Veach measure which is the flat measure on the entire stratum, H11, is a dense G delta. Now the intersection of two dense G deltas is a dense G delta, so I've got a dense G delta set of points that converge to one thing along one subsequence and another thing along another subsequence. That means they don't converge. systems, this is kind of what you expect to happen. The fact that in Ratner theory you really get um, that measures converge for all orbits and they're not uniquely ergodic, so there's more than one invariant measure, uh, more than one ergodic measure, is shocking. Right? And you really expect to have this sort of thing happen right? for basically these kinds of soft reasons. And there's various contexts in which you can prove this. Including IETs, right? Including IETs. 
including IETs that are not uniquely guided. Anytime you have a minimal system that's not uniquely guided, like IETs with mild continuity assumptions. So I now say that I'm done with part B, so if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. Awesome. So now I want to focus on the spiky fish. So what's my next goal? My next goal is to establish the following theorem. So this is part, uh, yeah. okay, um, okay. Uh, so this omega will be, it'll be a tremor. That shouldn't be too shocking to people at this point in the talk. It'll be a tremor L of omega prime for some Omega prime in E with minimal, not uniquely ergodic foliation, horizontal foliation. So what does our argument rely on? It rely, will rely on arguments very much in, in spirit similar to what we did before. So continuity arguments very similar to what we did before. And what it's also going to rely on is these, co is these moral copies of SL2RF mod SL2Z sitting inside of, our sp of the eigenfor locus, which when we tremor them, sit inside the spiky fish. Notice I requested this to be aperiodic. I didn't request it to be minimal. Okay. Um, so, and it's going to rely on those, and then I can apply old results of Headland to understand what the orbits are on these copies sitting of SL2R mod SL2Z sitting inside that have been tremored and sitting inside my spiky fish, and that's going to be what powers my continuity arguments. So, are people happy with this? So, maybe I'll be a little more precise and state the kind of results I want to prove. So, I want to prove two things. So, thing, uh, thing one. Um, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an H so that the tremor for time L of the set of omega, so that uh, omega <laughs> is an E and has a horizontal slit, of length H is epsilon dense in uh, the spiky fish, the L spiky fish. Um, so what am I going to do? I'm going to take this locus, I'm going to tremor this locus, this copy of SL2R mod SL2C, and I'm going to get something that's epsilon dense in the spiky fish. I want to do is I want to set about proving this, and then I'll be using results of Headland on this set. So the starting point is going to be a proposition that morally, if you guys remember the question Anton asked at the end of the talk, which was, give me an example other than these kind of right style subsurface deformations, and Barak basically said, take a limit of those. And the next proposition says Barak couldn't have said anything better in our special case. 
<laughs> I hope I described what you said accurately. <laughs> Proposition. So if omega in E4 is aperiodic, and not uniquely about it, I'm stating stronger assumptions than are necessary in order to put context, the context we care about. Right? So I'm emphasizing the context we care about. I can drop some of these words and it's still true. Okay? So and not uniquely ergodic. Uh, then for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists H and omega prime in F of H. Uh, F sub A, F sub capital H, F sub capital H. So those are two uh, tori glued along a slit of length exactly H, two identical tori. Uh, John, can I ask, can I ask yeah. You? So, so if I understand correctly, this thing one statement has two bits of information. One is your epsilon density the spiky fish, and the other is you're actually in the spiky fish. Yes. And so this proposition is supposed to explain why you're actually in the spiky fish or the other, or the other, or why you're epsilon It's going to be epsilon dense. Okay. Um, okay, so and omega prime is in F of H with a periodic horizontal foliation. is epsilon close to omega. Omega. And <laughs> the simplex of invariant measures <laughs> for the horizontal flow. Omega prime is epsilon close to the simplex. For omega. So uh, invariant measures come in convex families. I'm going to choose kind of a normalization so I get actually a simplex of these objects. I'm going to get cinder of that for my base surface. And I want to approximate myself not only in terms of where I'm sitting in the stratum, but also how my it, also I want to approximate my set of invariant measures. Does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody want me to maybe make this more concrete? What I mean? Okay, great. Okay, so let me hum a few bars of how this proof goes. So these this surface has a projection to the space of tori. Now, in a torus, under geodesic flow, you always are either recurrent or you come from a periodic direction, and then you go shoot off straight into this cusp. You might spend 100% of your life in the cusp, but you always come back to some fixed compact part infinitely often if you're aperiodic. So uh, this omega has to come back infinitely often to the compact part of the space of tori. So that's fact one, idea of proof. Uh, G minus T omega comes back. Uh, because I'm doing horizontal <coughs> flow rather than vertical flow, I have to do minus T, and I'm doing horizontal flow so it plays well with the horizontal flow cycle. Yeah. So, uh, a choice had to be made. Comes back to the compact part. In space of four. So it projects to this compact part in the space of Tor. So that's step one. Now, uh, Maser proved that if I'm not uniquely ergodic, then I better be diverging in actual H11. So if I'm in the compact part in the space of Tori, 
which means this side and this side are both reasonable, what could possibly be short? My slit has to be microscopic. I may, sir. Uh, I diverge. In H11. And so the slit is tiny. So what's the idea? This tiny slit, I just can do a small deformation and I can bring it to the horizontal. I can then pull myself back under the reverse of g to the minus t, or uh, under, called g to the t, and I end up with a surface very, very close to the surface I started with. And my next claim is this, I, if I waited long enough to do this, then my measure then my measures is close. So 3, if I waited long enough, t is big enough. So what I just explained was how to get the closeness in H11 condition, but why do I get the simplex condition? Well, m morally, this is the idea of the Schwarzman asymptotic cycle. So what I do is I've flown for an extreme, a, a, a trajectory of length one on my renormalized torus is an enormous trajectory on my original torus. By effectivizing the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, I can assume that the empirical measure of that is very close to my ergodic measure. Okay? Now I've changed things a little bit, but I can make my change so that it never reflect, uh, affected this trajectory I chose. So this trajectory on a new surface is close to the trajectory on the surface I started with because I didn't change anything affected. I pull that back, it corresponds to an extremely long trajectory on the starting orbit, and these things are close, and that gives me my simplex condition because it suffices to check on the, that I get the ergodic measures close. Are you feel happy with that? Oh, and I left out one important part, makes move tiny slit to be horizontal. Okay. So this was to describe this proposition, and this proposition is great, and I'm really happy with it, and it sort of goes to Anton's question and Barak's response to it that any ergodic thing arises as a limit. You can interpret that in this way. Um, unfortunately, it's not strong enough, so we need an even more technical proposition. So, if omega in E4 is aperiodic, not uniquely ergonomic, and mu is an invariant measure, Then, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an H naught, so that for all H bigger than H naught, there exists omega, uh, omega in uh, omega prime in F sub H with aperiodic <coughs> it's automatically going to have not uniquely ergodic horizontal flow. The horizontal flow is not even going to be minimal. Um, so that omega prime is close to omega. And an ergodic measure for omega prime, for the horizontal flow on omega prime is close to you know, So what does this theorem say? This theorem gives, tells us that we can approximate a minimal guy for the horizontal flow by uh, a non-minimal guy and approximate all of its measures simultaneously, the simplex. This is saying I can pro approximate a minimal guy with an invariant measure by a non-minimal guy with an ergodic measure. Right? And morally, this moment is where we're getting s less than or equal to l. Right? That's how we're getting the things less than L, just to call attention. 
So once again, just to say, this is a bit of a mouthful, especially in a talk, so what's the basic idea again? I can take a, I can take a guy with a horizontal flow, and I can pick an invariant measure for the horizontal flow, and I can approximate that by an ergodic measure for a different surface. And moreover, the surface is going to be my locus F sub H, where I can reply to all the results of Hedlund about uh, density of, of uh, UT orbits. So I've now taken care of thing one. Uh, oh yeah. So now, proof of thing one. So how does the proof of thing one go? So the proof of thing one goes, choose Q1, Qn in S sub L that are epsilon dense. <coughs> really, I need to intersect with a compact set, but let's ignore that subtlety. Okay? So I can get a finite epsilon dense set for each Qi uh, get H naught as in proposition two, second proposition. Okay. Uh, choose H greater than the maximum of the H naught and appeal to second proposition. One of them, so the important thing I'm taking advantage of this <coughs> is that I get this for all h bigger than h naught. So when I choose an h big enough, I can get all of these simultaneously, and I'm epsilon close to an epsilon dense set, so I'm two epsilon dense. Okay. So now, uh, So we have the following corollary for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists H sub epsilon and then H so that the trem sub L of F H is epsilon dense in E intersect the compact set. Okay, so that's our happy corollary. And now what we can do is we can appeal to Hedlund. To produce Q. Q in trem L of FH. So that uh, ut of q is epsilon is dense in trem l of s b, and so dense in and so epsilon dense in um, s of l. So I've got a dense set and a set that's epsilon dense, so this set's epsilon dense. Everyone happy with this? Okay. Now John, maybe we should say we state the Hedlund theorem. Okay, so theorem Hedlund. Okay. So the theorem Hedlund If X is in S L. Did you only do SL2 R on SL2 Z? Oh, so ut of x uh, is either a closed orbit, and this will show up when my horizontal flow is periodic, 
four deaths in the SL2 arm of the SL2 is A. Okay, so what we have now is we have a uh, UT orbit that's epsilon dense in my space. Now because uh, I get epsilon dense, there's some finite time at which I get epsilon over, uh, which, at which I get two epsilon dense, and this is an open condition. So what I'm able to construct is, can construct open dense subsets V sub k contained in my complete metric space, uh, the, L, the L spiky fish. So they're open as subsets of S sub L, and they're dense as subsets of S sub L, uh, so that for all x in Q in V sub k, uh, the set U sub t of Q um, is 1 over k dense in uh, my spiky fish intersected with the compact part. Okay. So I get dense, and then I just say bare category theorem. By bare category theorem, these are contained in the spiky fish. Uh, I'm sorry, by the bare category theorem, the intersection is not empty. continuity and the bare category theorem to get what, what, what I need. And so most of the work is in this proposition I can prove for you guys. But morally, it's very similar to what I explained. It's just more traumatic of a deformation that requires a little more work. Oh, now I should also make another remark. So, uh, I'm not going to prove this, um, but what I have is that I've got a weird orbit closure. Um, now, I want to mumble a few words about the containment. In the second property, the fact so what's the key idea of two? Key idea of containment. What's the key idea of containment? The key idea of the, the time L tremor. Uh, the time L over two tremor is the same as for an ergodic measure. Is the time L for a non-ergodic measure, for a different measure? Okay, so the ergodic measures are kind of moving away as fast as they could. And if I choose a measure that's not ergodic, it's moving away slower. So when I appeal to this proposition, I catch the times that are going slower. And that's kind of how the less than or equal to L comes from, and gives me two. What was two? One. 
One. One. Okay. Sorry. So I want to briefly state uh, a couple of other results. So that, uh, so Barak told us that some results from, yes? Can you explain the last statement again, please? So, I, so in Barak's talk, I could tremor with respect. So the question is, can I explain this statement again? So in Barak's talk, um, he explained that we could tremor with respect to different invariant measures. So if I normalize the size of things, the fastest I could move away from the eigenform locus, just taken on faith, it should probably be fairly believable, is with respect to an ergodic measure. What if I didn't tremor with respect to an ergodic measure? I tremored with something that was three quarters one ergodic measure plus one quarter another ergodic measure. It still has the same total size. The claim is that I'd be traveling away a little bit slower. Okay? And so what the um, proposition um, Oh, the proposition that's what P gives me is that I can approximate the other invariant measures by things in the maximal spiky fish. That's how I can get it. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thanks for that question. So, I mean, it explains why I stated a proposition that was such a mouthful. Okay? All right, so Barak said some things that were kind of anti Ratner type results, and there's many techniques in homogeneous dynamics that our results kind of formally imply are not true. And so now I'll mention uh, at least one, I'll mention one of them. So we have this following theorem of Daniel, Damian Margulis. So the theorem of Damian Margulis. <coughs> Let S be a subset of some gamma gamma be closed. So that S is equal to some W mod gamma, where W is closed, subgroup. Generated by unipotence. For X in G mod gamma, set minus s. So this is denoting set minus. I'm just removing the set s. Um, there exists uh, v, a neighborhood of s. And uh, so that for all t greater than 0, we have the cardinality um, is at 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to capital T. So that u sub t of x is in v is less than epsilon t. So what's one kind of candidate that one should think about for this in our setting? Imagine that s is, imagine we're not actually in a g by gamma. Imagine we're in a stratum of uh, of translation surfaces, and imagine S is some SL2R invariant over orbit closure. And what the dream would be is if I don't start out in that, I don't spend too much time near it. Okay? And this is actually true if instead of the horror cycle flow, I'm using a bigger part of SL2R. And this was one of the key results in Eskin, Mirzakani, Mohammadi, and it helps them prove a lot of uniform uh, ergodic theorems in this setting. It's a really useful tool. Um, and this is false. So, um, this is false. This is false for H11. In the following sense. So, this set W mod gamma, you should think that it should stand, what we should put in for it in our setting should be SL to our orbit closures. Right? And what we've produced is. Uh, it actually showed up at the end of Barak's talk. There are points that are outside of the eigenform locus, which is an SL to our orbit closure, so that they spend 100% of their time in an epsilon neighborhood of the orbit closure. This is false for H11 with uh, 
um, w bar gamma replaced by the eigenform of this. No, because you could choose V after X. You could choose V oh. uniform if you do it in a compact subset of um, G mod gamma minus S. Do that? Good. Great. Okay, so uh, in the last five minutes, I'll quickly ask some questions of people because uh, the best defense is a good offense. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the first question that I think is an important one is, does measure classification work? So are all Horus cycle invariant measures uh, supported on affine uh, supported on uh, some manifolds which are invariant for the Horus cycle flow, and they're the natural kind of affine measure on that? Does Ratner's measure classification hold? Yes, it does hold for homogeneous spaces. So now question two. So are you asking this for H11 or just in general? In general. In general. In general. Yeah, so try H11 first. <laughs> in that, you're try H2 first? Or H2. But then got question two, which is that uh, can you build the R type of weird examples? Weird examples. I mean, maybe life is much better. Maybe the whole Ratner theory is true in H2. I don't know. We don't have, I think, meaningful counterexamples in this stuff. Um, so question three, which is a question I particularly like, which is, are all horror cycles recurrent? Are all horror cycle orbits in the sense of topological dynamics? Horror cycles recurrent. That is, for all x and epsilon greater than zero uh, is the distance between u, t, x and x uh, less than epsilon for an unbounded sequence of t. So this is not recurrence in the sense of uh, Maser's theorem, it's a stronger notion of recurrence. It's not just asking that we return to a compact set, which we already know we do by Minsky and Weiss. But by work of Vich, you proved a quantitative version of that. Um, but I'm actually requesting that you return to any neighborhood of yourself, that you're in the closure of your own neighborhood. <laughs> and I think that's a good place to stop. There's a hope for for uh, uh, for two. Um, I mean, in other words, all of this stuff says that the generic point part of Ratner doesn't work, but but maybe still the measure the measure theory might work. Is that kind of a hope? One can always hope. Okay. <laughs> yes. Is there, an, is there an explicit example of a special theory in H11? I'm sorry. In part B of the theorem. Is there an explicit construction? Uh, no, no, I, I, no, no, there isn't. Yeah. I suspect if you really cared, it could be written down, but I suspect it would be pretty awful. Right. So what would you have to do? So what you would have to do is you'd have to find your surface that's close to this H. Um, oh, actually things would be, I'll, talk, I'll mention it later. Yeah. 